a little bit out of hand. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, let's. Before lunch, uh, we will have uh, general talks about uh, yeah, open bike data and mapping in general. And um, after talks, before the lunch time, we won't really have any time for questions. Um, but we have a fancy solution, which, is, uh, <laughs> which uh, Mustafa will explain. Um, it's a simple online platform where you can ask for questions and we maybe also hold a poll on there. So if you go to the C.W.O. website, you can enter the code and it will be uh, an event room and there you can post your questions and they will be answered during the period of talks afterwards. Yep. So, yeah, so this website, that's good. Um, feel free to ask any question you want. Uh, so now it's time for our first speaker. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome, David. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Just a sec, please. Technical problems. Yeah, yeah. For this series, I've got it here. Can I have my pillar in? Luft, can I have my pillar in? Nee? Nee. Oh, dat is een betere voordracht gegeven, Luft. Okay, everyone. Good morning. My pillar in. So, my name is David Robinson, and I'm a student from the Open Summer of Code, and. I'm, I'm just one of, of 40 students, and, just, and, and I'm part of just one of like 10 teams that are building applications, open source applications, that will solve cutting edge uh, issues, well, will we'll solve issues with, with, with cutting edge solutions. And one of these problems that, we, that, that we're working with is, is, the, is to ensure that data for a navigation app is good enough so it can be used in Brussels. So our client, my, my, the client that I'm working with is, is Brussels Mobility. And part of their program for Bike for Brussels, they are really trying to encourage people to cycle more. And, 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 and because there are a lot more people cy um, cycling in the city, you, you have a, this demand. And because of this, we, we need a lot of, we need better infrastructure to try to get people around safely and efficiently. So this is where Open Sum of Code comes into play. And I'm part of two teams, really. And one team is about data, and the other team is about an app to try to navigate around the city. So we know all the issues that cyclists encounter, heavy road traffic, tram tracks, do you want to get your, your, your wheels stuck there, traffic lights. No one really likes to wait too long to, to get somewhere. So uh, with all these issues in, in, in consideration, the Brussels government in the last how many years now have been developing a, a, a regional network. And this regional network is to, you know, to, to accommodate the growing cycling, cyc cyclists in the city. And they have a goal to try to have 20% of, of people's journeys t taken by the bike. And for this to happen, you have the regional cycling network. And in, 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 with its names in, in French and Dutch, and this network uh, goes through all the different communes of, of Brussels, all 19 of them, and it's really more appropriate for medium to long distance journeys. And it avoids all the issues that you may encounter because the, the routes are, are chosen with uh, w it's chosen in mind to avoid steep inclines and high traffic areas. So 
the, the, this route system has a has a color system and also a a, a coding system and with and, 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 and then you have this a network that goes all over Brussels. I'll show you a map. And this is just a preview. And so with this map, you probably want to go somewhere today. You know, you want to go from point A to point B. And how will you do that? And uh, the, 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 the government, or, or the Brussels Mobility, they have a solution already. And it's a, it's a paper map. But how can you really get around with, with this on a bike? It's not so handy, in, in, a, in a way. So, so as a transportation, transportation science, I have to, you know, we have to think really d deeply about this and what is the solution, and 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 and, and try to get inspiration from other <coughs> sources of uh, how other travel information is conveyed to to people. And already, you for driving and public transport use, travel information is quite developed, and and and, and you have apps that that really support the, the traveler throughout this throughout an infrastructure, it, whether it's a, a road network or public transport infrastructure. So, you know, you, you may see this on a phone and you can you already see the imagery of the of the signage. So you can better situate yourself in a physical environment with with, with, with some visuals that that is linked to route um, coding and route coloration and this is another example so you know it's a lot of public transport lines you'll see colors and, 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 and routes and so on and this is just an example you know you see in, you see you're looking for a bus and the, and, and the, the information will show the, the color and the, the code and it will be linked to something actually physical in the in, in the network and this is what we're trying to get at for a navigation app for Brussels. And we have been working on, um, on this, and it's a, it's a web app, so no installation needed on your phone. Uh, so it's quite versatile across different platforms. You just need a, a modern smartphone. And if you want to get from point A to point B, you can just choose, your, choose the destination. And <coughs> With a GPS unit on your phone, it will can tell where you are, or you can input your your location, and and this is just a visualization <coughs> of the app that has been developed by by my, my fellow teammates, and as you can see, it it travels with you, and it will go through the, the routes. It matches the, the route colors, and the, and and also the route co coded co the, the the route co um, coding. So you can really not get, it will be a lot more difficult to get lost along your way. And this will be quite useful for people who are trying to get acquainted with this regional network. But with this app, then we have next problem. How, what's the, the, the data? So we have a problem, but like the, we, have this pow we have a powerful uh, tool, a solution, but usually very complicated thing requires complicated data inputs. And on one end, we have, we have a, partially a solution from the Brussels government where they have open data, uh, and which, which is freely available. But the thing is, and, and you, you can get it from the, these different websites here, so it, which is really, really good. But the problem is that we have another problem. So we have open data, and what are, and, and how, how, how are we going to make it useful and, and, and usable and, and, and appropriate? And OpenStreetMap has the solution. So how do you get, so we have one open data source and, and another one. And so this is a sort of a situation between how to improve one open geo data set, which is OpenStreetMap. It's beyond simply maps, but you know a, a data source that you can do a lot with. And, and it's enriching that. Uh, that, that source of, of data for, for the app. And we are, so we advanced the project by using the Brussels data as a reference to, for the OpenStreetMap co community. As you know, OpenStreetMap is, 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 is maps that are crowdsourced and you have individuals with their no local knowledge mapping areas. But the thing about it is that 
mapping areas that are, are, are um, that are too distant will be difficult um, for them. So they need a bit of help <coughs> to try to understand where the routes are and, and to get a, a complete picture um, to help their work. So you have the open data from, from the Brussels government and you have OpenStreetMap. And the open data is from Brussels. It's quite generalized. It's good for cartography. You've probably made this little map here, which is great. But it's too generalized for routing. and and it's but, but though it's a, it's a really reliable reference because the the map relates to infrastructure. The government put the infrastructure and they create a digital map for it. So it should be quite reliable to know where the routes exist in reality, and it's available. Importantly, so we have OpenStreetMap, as I said, that's crowd um, sourced and and open. And it's beyond cartography and has, can support really advanced applications with a very active community in Belgium, which is important. You can't have OpenStreetMap and not, not many mappers working in the community. So and already OpenStreetMap is, is quite superior to when uh, mapping cycling data when, when compared to, to Google Maps, and which, is, which demonstrates the potential of uh, OpenStreetMap. So just, we, so we basically, I'm just gonna give a very general overview, because Dieter and, and Mustafa, my, my teammates, they're gonna give, go into the details in the workshop. So we just identify geometric and, and attribute conflicts, and then we send visually this, these issues to the OpenStreetMap community. And here you can see in the, the network, and this is, the con this is identified where OpenStreetMap, OpenStreetMap where the cycling network is not properly mapped. This just shows a simple, um, the locations of the gaps. But the map, right, as, it, as it is, goes beyond this. And they will explain you these details. So just to summarize, open data, open street map, and team one, validation, open street map community. And then, because you have, as the data becomes complete and reliable, the, we have a routing app, which I explained before. And I thank you for your attention, and I must give reference to my awesome teammates who developed the, the front end and the back end, and the design, which is most, imp most importantly, and also our two coaches. So thank you. Great. So, Coop? <coughs> behind the, the Royal Horse Parade, um, and even cyclists in the past. Um, but it was a, um, I'm here for, for Horizontal Cities, a company I just started a few years ago, um, because 10 years ago I moved to, to Lisbon, and I was very naive, uh, I was a bit naive um, of, uh, of just bringing my bicycle with me on the road, I didn't know anything about the city. And I arrived and I had no idea how to, how to cycle. Because how do you cycle in a city built on seven hills? Uh, and how do you do it in a smart way? Uh, I had really had no clue. I was completely lost. So 
Um, you go on, so just, just try it out and just try on the error. Um, but in the end, in around 2017, so I was already back uh, in Brussels again, uh, all of a sudden I had a, I had a topography. Uh, I, had a, I had a street map, not open street map, <coughs> a map I got somewhere. Uh, and I started just to, to, to calculate uh, the incline of every street and every segment of street in the, uh, of the city. And developed them a cycling master plan for Lisbon, which arrived at having uh, the possibility of creating a more or less flat network of 691 kilometers out of 1,000 and a bit more. So it meant that more or less 60, 70% of the city was easily uh, cyclable, but there was no way to find out in an easy way. It was just uh, because the lizard goes up and down and up and down. And you really have to know the street by going uh, in the back street and going, uh, not take just the, the main street. So there was the arrival of a, a cycling master plan. Uh, didn't result in anything specific, uh, but then we were contacted to uh, participate in what, uh, a project called Big Smart City. And I'm a landscape architect, urban information. I'm anything about coding or anything about technology. Uh, but we were asked to, to enter in a, in a competition to transform something into uh, an app or into technology that would be useful. So we participated just with the, the ID, um, and it was a bit more <coughs> heavy than we thought, this kind of uh, six-week formation where you have to form teams and make business models and plans. We ended up winning it, and it uh, resulted in uh, an application called Horizontal. Um, actually, an urban navigation application where the topography is uh, uh, linked to, to the street network. So you can really find the route of least resistance. And it has, uh, the particle part is based on the physical profile of the end user. So you, the people that just start cycling right now, because Lisbon has a very low number of, of cyclists, they can find the easy route. They can even, uh, the app will show them where the best part would be just for walking. But then you also have the, the route for the, the more professional user and they will get the, the shorter, but maybe also the steeper. And then of course, there's all the normal things an app has to do. Uh, turn by turn, voice guidance, and blah, blah, blah. Gives you some uh, CO2 savings, some uh, financial savings, the calories we burn. So now the app is working for iOS, for Lisbon and Brussels. Uh, we're working also on the Android version. Um, it should be finished in September. Uh, and we will launch in Madrid, Zurich, and Berlin as it's more or less flat. Uh, we're going to just test it out uh, to see how things work. So, how do we use, uh, how do we link with OpenStreetMaps? Um, our technology is, 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 is quite easy. We have the, a database with topography, and we link streets. And that gets into a, a routing engine, which is based on OSRM. Uh, and then we send it to, uh, to our application, which can be used to any uh, application out there. Uh, so there's, there's possibilities for, for future development. Now it's made so that one day maybe we can monitor also electric cars to see how they can save battery <coughs> uh, over the time in, in a city with, uh, with topography. Um, and this is the topography you use, and I showed you an, an example of Essen in Germany, a place we are uh, working on right now. This is the area, it's 200 square kilometers, so a little bit bigger than the Brussels uh, region. Normal applications that use topographical data use uh, the SRTM 90 meters data of the NASA, and this, now the, uh, the, and this is the resolution, so it's 90 meters uh, grid, with an error, a vertical error of 16 meters. So in terms of slope calculations for cycling, not the uh, most, uh, the, the best one. The Japanese have now uh, uh, released a 30 meter grid based on the five meter grid, but the five meters is, is, uh, is protected, so it's not open source. Still, this is the, the quality of the data. We use LIDAR, which is uh, uh, laser uh, data that you get from a plane on the satellite, uh, which is one meter, Problem is that it's much more small, smaller data sets, so you can't get the whole world at, at once. It's not available for the whole world. But for example, for Brussels, uh, that gives you 32 points per square meter, and that this is the perspective difference from 30 meters to uh, one meter. Uh, that means for the app in Brussels, we 
processed five, five billion uh, topographic points just to get the most correct topography, uh, which needed some heavy uh, computing. But this is uh, more or less the, the, the resolution when you go into detail. So this is a 30 meter bit on the gray part, and this is what we have. So you can really see the difference, that you can, you can really get the, the correct slope, and it's important to know that uh, only half percent of slope difference uh, already requires almost uh, half or double the energy uh, extra for, for a certain route. So uh, that's what we call the faux plat. So it's, it's, uh, it's what you really feel, and it's, really, it's, it's a different one. So that's what we, that's what we do. Uh, this is the topography part. From, uh, we also work with rolling resistance. So depending on the material you use, uh, on the street uh, material, you have uh, a different resistance. So there we go. Uh, also, we use open street maps to base on uh, on the surface definition they have. So uh, if people fill in the surface definition, it's uh, very nice for us if it's, if it's uh, very specific because then we get uh, the we, we use to have the, the specific rolling uh, resistance uh, conference um, coefficient that we link to our in our algorithm, and so we calculate the route so that. For the same route, if he would have a street on asphalt and a street on cobblestones, he would, he would say, like, well, the co the cobblestones are more difficult, it takes you more time. If you want to, you can take it, of course. It doesn't say you shouldn't take it. Uh, but it takes you more time and more energy. So please take the asphalt road. Um, so we all base it on the, the energy that's needed for uh, using a certain route. And now we also use the cycling infrastructure. Um, where uh, the, the local and the regional cycling uh, routes are inserted, and uh, where we also use uh, the, the definition of the street maps for uh, giving an advantage uh, to, to cycle lanes and protected cycle lanes. So the better the definition in open street maps, the more accurate our uh, information and our, our routing. And then we have, of course, our profile, where we have starters and, and people with normal profiles, and then sportsmen or sportswomen. Um, the next step will also be to, to, to have like electric e-bikes uh, solution because uh, even with an e-bike, uh, it doesn't. It allows you to go everywhere. You have like an extra 200 watts in your legs, uh, but still you can you can shoot another route. So what I said, just put the developments. Android is on the way, and then uh, there's some interesting things that we are developing uh, now, but it will be only for the end of the year probably. Uh, that's the integration of cycling highways. Uh, points of interest, bicycle parking, bicycle shops, whatever, everything you could need on the way, a shower. Um, uh, in Lisbon and Brussels, there's a, in Brussels there's only one, I think, a bicycle elevator at, uh, at Sablon. It's uh, interesting to integrate it in the routing too, so you can just go to Sablon, then have to go up higher. He would calculate if it's if it's indeed more interesting to take the detour to go to Sablon, then just from Palais Justi to go down. In Lisbon, there's some more uh, bicycle elevators, so there you can I almost go to the to the castle, which is said to be the impossible point. But this app will show you that no, it's not impossible to go by a bike. You just the last maybe the last ten meters, you just may want to walk, but you can take your bike up, or you go up and then you just go downhill to you know place your destination in the middle of the. Uh, and the last step <coughs> is the integration of public transport, metro line, bus line, where it's allowed to take a bicycle on uh, on the public transport. So especially in Lisbon, uh, are you always used to take the metro to the highest point in, in town and then run just downhill? Uh, because if, if it's 35 degrees, you don't feel like cycling for half an hour. So I just went downhill. Uh, it was very good for my calorie uh, burning, uh, but at least I didn't arrive with a, a red hair. Um, and we're scaling. We're trying to scale uh, short term Madrid, Madrid, Berlin, next to Lisbon and Brussels. And we are working on uh, getting the back end uh, a bit more efficient because we have. At this time, 10% of the world on very high uh, quality topographic data, but our infrastructure is not scaled yet to get all this data inside and all the processing. So we just need to improve the processing a little bit, and then we can go to more. So if you have any questions, this is a fancy uh, site. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the this is what we have more. It's a bit more than than 10%. Uh, 10%. But we cannot go yet to, to the 400. And this is the team, just, uh, actually this is the core team. This is everything that we gathered around it, but it's, uh, we, had, we, we managed to gather the European Space Agency and IBM and Amazon and, uh, as, as partners and sponsors uh, on the project, uh, which, is, uh, which is fun to have a very small idea.
uh, some support from even big companies. They, they help out a lot. Thank you very much. I'm not sure those people are here. They, they are picture. just following online by the live stream. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, yes. so now I have to come up with an answer in five seconds. <laughs> answer is, uh, OSM is always superior to Google Maps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there was a question about the last presentation. Uh, what's the work required to scale the application to a new city? To a new city? Yeah. Uh, that's actually the topographical processing, so we need to get all the topographic data. So Zurich, for example, uh, was Brussels was 5 billion uh, topographic points, Zurich was 20 billion. Is it in Swiss? So they, they did it very profound. Uh, yeah, more than 32 points per square meter. So it was it kind was of a lot of work well, so to get this through. Yeah, yeah, it, was, uh, yeah. it was two terabytes of, uh, of topographic data. So we had to process it. So <coughs> it took like uh, a bit longer than Brussels. Brussels was like four hours to process. So we took two hours. Um, and then it's pre-processing and post-processing to get it in the OSRM. I don't know if somebody knows what's OSRM. If you go to street, uh, go to street routing machine. Uh, it's like a... It's like a black box where you put the route and you, you, you ask a question and it comes to the route. So, uh, and you can, you can add some parameters and you can add data and you can add a, a raster behind it. So actually you can, you can route with topography, but you can also route around uh, route areas or if there would be uh, an inundation area and you have a beautiful metal deck, you can also make sure that your route doesn't go through the inundation or whatever it is. Uh, map it is. Uh, but it needs pre-processing and post-processing. You want to send data back about uh, all the data gets get broken when you get it out, it just gives you the root. So you want to have the information you want to use back. So it, it, that's that's more or less the time. So it, it would take let's say yeah, depending on the information, but between one week and a month for a new city to be done. Just computing time. Can you can you reflect a bit more on what you did with the LIDA data? What, what was the was it open and what was the... Yeah, we only use open data. Yeah. And what you don't you have money yet to, to pay for, uh, for yeah, data provided by a private company. We will, though, because now we have to... There's a, a northern... There's a, a region in Portugal where they want to have our technology and there's no data available of uh, an open source, so we, we need to buy it and uh, make the technology available. But it's... We... we yeah, we go online all the time looking for open leader data, which is yeah. like a continuous search and it's huge quantities. That's why we have a partnership with, uh, with IBM, uh, because I cannot do it at home to download two terabytes of uh, Swiss uh, topographic data. My, my wife would kill me and uh, <laughs> she couldn't watch. She couldn't go on Facebook anymore. Um, but then um, uh, uh, we download data, we process the data, uh, we upload it in, in, in a servers to process it and then half of the data goes, we throw it away because it takes too much uh, space again and then we only just use the final. What, what technology, what, what algorithms and what technology did you use to process it? Uh, we have to stop. <laughs> <Just> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we'll talk about uh, yeah. yeah. later. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So Let me the green count.
De wifi is nog in orde. Ik ben een upload aan het doen, maar dat gaat niet door tegen zeker. Dat is de rest is stilgevallen. Dat was spijtig. Ja, yeah. hi everybody. Um, I am, um, yeah, I just, I'm, uh, I'm going to split up the presentation in a weird way because um, of where, how I came to Mapbox, but officially I'm representing Mapbox today. I kind of assume that everyone knows what Mapbox is. It's a mapping pl platform that builds um, on top of OpenStreetMap, which is what we're very um, uh, uh, invested in OpenStreetMap and um, kind of, yeah, everyone knows us, <laughs> which is good um, at, at OSM. Um, and um, yeah, so I'll kind of jump over that. If you have questions about Mapbox, we can yeah, discuss that or, or answer them in the, in the coffee break. Um, so yeah, the MIME officially, uh, I am Mapbox Cities. Um, it's a program uh, that essentially works, uh, well, is um, intended to um, kind of, uh, work with cities um, across the globe um, uh, using Mapbox technology and um, um, answering the question or, or confirming that uh, what we believe is true, which is open cities are smart cities, are the real smart cities. Um, and um, if there's um, no, uh, if cities don't really use open data in, uh, in the best possible, most efficient way, there is no way that by uh, employing only closed by default um, proprietary data, they cannot become as smart. Um, there's a lot of you know, talk about this. Um, and yeah, because we're talking about, um, uh, yeah, bicycle data here today, um, I'm going to um, add as well like our connection to that, um, partly also OSRM, which is a routing engine that um, uh, you just mentioned. So, um, let's see, so smart cities, yeah, it's the, hopefully the only dark slide. Um, it's basically um, people imagine these like soulless tech hubs, um, but um, especially if we talk about sustainable urban transport, we do expect people or the trend is to, towards like making people cycle more, like the previous presentations have um, uh, confirmed that as well. And what I always feel like there's a lot of talk about data. So I walk around, um, I go to a lot of you know, different places and there are people always talk about data, but what they forget when they think about all these great apps is that there is a human element to, to it. Obviously with bicycle data, it's even more true than with other types of data. And so that's um, where human comes in. Um, human is an app uh, that, um, brought uh, me and the rest of the team to Mapbox. Um, and that's why I mentioned it here. And um, we were acquired last year by M Mapbox. Um, but um, the years leading up to the acquisition, we're, we learned a lot. Um, the, the app is still available, yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, app for iOS and Android. But um, yeah, we learned a lot about data and about how, how people use apps and um, how apps have to, cons to be considered, considered in order to actually uh, make a, the data output um, useful. So let's dive straight in. Yeah, so if we talk about active urban transport, it's a lot about motivation. Um, and a lot of great apps that are, you know, where the tech side is really, really good and everything it works really well. Um, if you can't get people to be motivated to use it, um, either by, you know, turning it on and off every day when they go to, you know, so you, you, you people use your app, um, that helps you get more, um, get better numbers that you can then present to investors and then you will put money back into you so you can invest into infrastructure just like you said just, just before. So it's like a really vicious cycle and it's super hard to get that um, going, which is why, um, uh, well, which is why yeah, you can do a lot of good stuff if you manage to get in, motivated uh, enough, enough people to uh, use your app, um, uh, especially when you, um, yeah, if the app is, um, you know, um, can actually track people, uh, track people using it rather not on the freeway, way, but actually producing data that you can uh, use to build a um, business model on top of it. Um, so you could use the app um, to track um, data on the, uh, on how people move around cities, which was part of um, what human did. Um, and um, uh, and so yeah, you can do amazing stuff with it. But then there is the last thing is that you have to you can say data is a business model. Um, so you is essentially think that you could you know generate enough data to sell it to yeah cities companies um, because yeah people say that um, data is a you know currency or, or, or um, but it's yeah it's not <coughs> but I'm going to show you some of the data that you can what, what you can do with data um, so that's for example a comparison of all the users we had um, all the data we have we have from human we had um, have data on 900 cities worldwide 
um, and then we would um, have the average city and compare that to um, specific cities. So that's Amsterdam. So there's not so much walking, quite a lot of cycling, it, and um, other always means that it's um, uh, it's it's not um, it's not tracked. Um, it's, it's tracked as active, um, which could be indoor. Um, because it automatic so human um, tracks automatically, so you don't have to turn it on or off. It's just in your pocket, and it just tracks um, whatever whatever you do based on the motion of the phone. Um, so that's the, the 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 good thing of it because you don't have to think about it. Um, so Amsterdam, uh, Copenhagen, uh, you see, there's already more walking, um, similar with bike. Um, LA, much more transport, which is mainly car there, um, almost no biking. You can visualize it like this, looks uh, very pretty, all the activity in Amsterdam. Paris, very different. Um, this is a really good one. Um, this is, uh, who knows what it is? Who recognizes it? Huh? The Burning Man. Yeah, that's Burning Man 2015. We basically just extracted uh, geo uh, uh, data by geofence and, um, and then actually you could see it like this, which is was very surprising for us as well. And we have a huge uh, user base in the, in the US because um, back then Human was uh, like an American company and uh, yeah, um, you know, people in Silicon Valley really like that kind of stuff. <laughs> so what I, I want to really make a point here that if there's a lot that technology can do but there's a lot more that you need in order to you know, pull, a success, pull off a, a successful bicycle tracking or bike app. So one is users, you need users for using the app which has certain, you know, um, implications, and then you have, you need to, if you want to make the data, you want to sell or have a business model around selling and making the data useful to cities, you also need to have someone actually walking around it, talking to all these cities, and they don't necessarily throw money at you, I can tell you that. Um, so there's the social part, and there's um, a tech, tech part um, to that challenge. Um, yeah, just really roughly, we can talk about all of this. I'm, I, yeah, I, there's a lot of uh, you know experience that we put into uh, into into like you know, bringing this all together. Um, yeah, and then when we talk about data, there's um, obviously a big players out there that um, like literally um, kind of distribute big data uh, and make like uh, make it available. And if we like uh, look at Strava Metro, they um, obviously have a lot of people using the app and they track, but it's actually more training the data from people training with the bike and then they say they use it for commutes as well but then they have to turn it on and off and it's really actually not that clean because people yeah forget turning it off so um, then they sell it to cities um, that's a business model waste connected citizens is um, it's, it's mainly focused on uh, obviously um, uh, uh, traffic data they're um, if they build a model around exchanging data so incident data from cities and then they can have, uh, cities can have access to what um, Waze finds through their app. And Uber Movement is um, obviously like actually lobbying products to calm cities down. So that, yeah, I'm not sure what actually is happening to that. So there's a lot of um, um, approaches there. So it's a funny <laughs> jump. So um, when we go back to Mapbox and Mapbox Cities, as a company that is built on top of OpenStreetMap, um, the crowd um, uh, sourcing aspect of um, of, uh, of, of um, uh, OpenStreetMap, but also other ways of crowd uh, crowd sourcing data in cities, is uh, really valuable to us. So I'm going to just show a few um, examples quite quickly. Um, this is now not related to uh, like uh, cycling per se, but um, I'll come back to that. Um, so uh, this is a, a project uh, for disaster response after a, uh, a really heavy monsoon rains in uh, in Chennai in 2015. Um, our team in Bangalore built um, this app on top of OpenStreetMap, and essentially people can just go to the website and add if their street, uh, like uh, tap at their street if it's um, flooded or not, and then um, the city um, instantly had um, like this whole database of crowdsourced information on what, which streets are actually affected by the monsoon and which not. They added um, topographical data in addition to make it um, uh, also for, for research uh, more understandable and also more logic, um, you know, which, you know, uh, streets are probably already flooded, um, and but it just really took off. So it's just a very quick um, example of like how you can use uh, like uh, OpenStreetMap technology, other open data sets, like topographical data, and then um, add the crowdsource data on top of it, and that is really of instant use for cities. And it's obviously very similar to what um, what um, the potential is for 
um, uh, bis uh, route, uh, um, mapping uh, bicycle routes in OpenStreetMap because everyone can contribute. Um, so yeah, they made it really easy here to just, you didn't have to log in, you just literally tapped, uh, you just used it. Um, they, they just completely opened it up, which made it much easier and much faster to, to contribute. Yeah, that's the data. There's another example, and that's actually where we're getting into um, uh, traffic safety. Um, so in the US, they have, they're very crazy about Vision Zero, which is um, essentially a traffic safety programs to eliminate um, tra uh, deaths by uh, by through traffic uh, car accidents in the city. And um, uh, this was a, a tool that um, our team built very quickly with a huge data set for the whole of the US um, to um, um, show in a more human-centered way how these, um, how these accidents, the data on accidents, how that could actually um, really reach the people um, of, uh, to change their behavior. So the idea was that um, um, everyone that is, um, someone that is yeah, living in whatever, this is San Francisco, I think, and they um, could put in a, um, their, their daily commute route and then um, um, through this um, web app they could see how many, uh, in the past year, how many accidents happened along the way and why they happened. Um, including, for example, data on uh, if, if a uh, cyclist was involved or if it uh, was due to um, alcohol or um, yeah, if pedestrians were involved. And this is a, it's just, it's a very quick, I mean, this was, it's not like rushed off or anything. It was very important to us to, um, to make sure that we, um, that we show how data, how open data in that way can be presented to the people, to the right audience in the right way that they actually get it. Because if you talk about there were whatever 500 um, accidents and 10 of them were um, involved in uh, uh, cyclists, it's different than if you say along your daily route there was so and so many um, um, uh, uh, you know cyclists struck uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, like uh, with fatal accidents. And I um, I think that rethinking of how data is presented is super important um, in order to reach people because we're all all of us are talking about data all the time. Um, I mean, especially me, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, it's like something that is very common, but a lot of people don't know what to expect. They just think like, oh, it's some, um, whatever, spreadsheet, and I don't have anything to do with it. But by presenting it in the right way and really targeted to the audience, um, especially geospatial data, we all are used to looking at maps, you know, but um, kind of rethinking of how the audience could understand the, the subject better is really helpful. Um, so yeah, we're working on the next um, next version of this, which is an official Vision Zero project. So this was um, uh, like um, for the whole of the US, with the Department of Transport, and um, and this is now um, this was literally me. This is one of my first um, ever visualizations. <laughs> it's not very good, but I just want to also point out that it's very easy if you have data sets, you put them together, and you think like, oh, it's amazing. It's so clear. And then, um, so what you see here is the um, traffic accidents that involve cyclists, and the more cyclists were involved, the bigger the, the dot is, and then the, the bike lanes are marked as well. And then, uh, in you know, red is the ones that are on the street, so they're not really protected bike lanes. So it's very different in, in the US than it is here in, uh, in, in, in Benelux in general. And so you look at it and you're like, oh man, it's weird that there's so many accidents on the bike lanes. Um, and, but it's really like that. I mean, people don't cycle where there's no bike lanes. It's not just like here where everyone cycles everywhere. There's literally a bike lane everywhere. It's, li you know, like because we, um, we don't know how many cyclists were there in total, it's very easy to make the mistake to say like, oh, the bike lanes are not good enough and we need to improve them because um, we all we know is that probably most cyclists um, are cycling along the bike routes, um, but but we don't know. So it's like um, very hard to use actual numbers because we need to relate them to a, to a total, and we don't have that total because we're basically using open data um, from police reports and um, the bike bike lanes um, uh, like uh, as they were um, kind of earlier this year. So it's it's very easy to use data in the wrong way, and that's why I just want to make that point. It's like, it's not, it's not only about getting data, it's also about um, kind of being very careful in the, the assumptions you make um, and really thinking it through and talking with lots of people because, um, um, uh, you know, like, yeah, we could easily tell DC to um, improve their bike lanes and make them all like, um, uh, like separate, but then probably there would be less bike lanes 
um, and it would be even harder for people to get around. That, that is very important to me because I think the represent, uh, making um, data representative of, of what you're trying to say is a, a huge challenge. Same is with apps. If you have an app that um, tracks, by, uh, um, tracks cyclists, you probably say you have so many users, but it might be not a representative like part of the actual population. So if you have an app in uh, Brussels um, that has uh, you know tracks uh, cyclists in Brussels and you have 300 people, then you don't know if by them, you would need to prove that by the, the demographics actually also match all of the people in Brussels that potentially ever cycle. And that makes it so super hard. And I think because of technology being so easy and everyone has a smartphone and everyone has a, you know, can, could technically have an app that tracks people and then it's you so easily jump into uh, um, assumptions um, that are wrong and then we just base everything on those wrong assumptions. So we need to just, Keep in mind that this is very important, um, especially when we try and convince you know people of, of the mobility um, department uh, at the city that um, our data you know is really valuable to them. So it can be, but often you need to have a lot of different types of data. Um, so yeah, now I'm going to go to Mapbox, which um, uh, um, because there's a, so a few things that are very interesting. One of them is the routing um, engine, OSRM, which um, is an open source routing engine, and some of our team members in Germany are working on that with other people as well. Um, and uh, so Mapbox essentially has like these mapping tools, and we like power some of really big apps um, out there. One, uh, yeah, one is some are more um, known than others, um, but essentially um, we are able to derive uh, very short location updates from people using the apps. Uh, the, the maps in the apps or the, the apps with our maps in um, and um, and from that we can um, kind of with over time with all the data that we get all the time and process really quickly we can essentially kind of build a very um, clear picture of how a city or how the network or the trans uh, the infrastructure of a city is being used so it could be like this is um, uh, San Francisco but um, it could be very dense a lot of data and very clear where people go so if you take this a step further, we can use it in order to, and because all our maps are based on OpenStreetMap data, it's very important for us to improve that. We can use the data that we collect to find missing streets for OSM and then have our team members talk with the local community and then add those streets um, based on local knowledge or also um, connect that data. Seeing that there's people always just going to the right, it might be a restriction to go to the left but it's not mapped yet, so we can cross-check those things. You know, it starts with the data, because it's like big data and it's like global, and then we zoom in and then um, bring the local teams um, of OSM in the different uh, locations um, and regions on board to um, kind of check if this is really, a, if there's a trend restriction that hasn't been mapped or not. Over time, that data helps us to make the map really, really accurate, and we, yeah, as I said, we pull it all back into um, OSM, um, and then for like commercial products, um, yeah, we obviously then, uh, all, well, if we're fast enough with um, processing it, we have real-time traffic data, um, which we can use for um, navigation. Um, right now we're really, I mean, obviously we're, it's an American company, so we're focused on, um, uh, uh, you know, car traffic, but um, um, over time you could do that for other modes of transport as well. Um, yeah, and then the next step, and it sounds very futuristic, but yeah, of course, um, autonomous vehicles, so the, uh, the more information we have, the clearer and cleaner the maps become, and we can actually create these HD maps that are used for uh, yeah, autonomous vehicles, which is a product right now called Mapbox Drive. Um, so that's an example of how <coughs> the data looks when you like not clean it up. <laughs> but yeah, it's a lot of people driving by. We don't know who it is, we just know someone was driving there, which is a, a really a huge benefit for us, of course. Um, so it's just looping, but it's very, um, it can be cleaned out, um, so it's very precise, and we can like literally see, you know, very clearly which um, lanes are being used, and then make assumptions based on that, how many um, lanes there are to use on that part of the road. Um, the cool thing is that what we, one of the early products that we built from this is a, um, it's a map style, um, a traffic map style, <coughs> that everyone can use, it's, um, so Mapbox has a product where you um, log in, it's like called Mapbox Studio. It essentially uses Mapbox data, um, uh, OSM data, and then it has a style like a um, kind of um, appearance to it. 
And one of those appearance, ha uh, like uh, this is the light one, has a, um, a layer of the live traffic conditions derived from historic data and real-time data um, and then basically processed in a way that you can, um, yeah, you could, you can use that. Um, for example, I mean, I'm just giving some examples. You could, you know, build a navigation um, web app or a mobile app that shows the style. So if you are uh, showing like live bus tracking, um, it just explains or shows that the bus you're taking may be in traffic a bit further down the road, um, and that's why it's delayed. Um, you know, there's a lot of applications for that, for uh, bicycle uh, routing as well. So if you um, know, you can, you could technically build a routing profile for cyclists that um, routes around the heavy traffic, which yeah, is obviously nice. Um, yeah, and that's uh, actually, that's around here. But I didn't, I mean, obviously it's not from now, it's not live, I just, I think I took the screenshot uh, lunchtime a few days ago. Um, and it's, yeah, it's surprising uh, really how, um, how, how much we know, <laughs> how, how um, uh, precise this is. This is one of the products that our colleagues, uh, one of my colleague, uh, colleagues in uh, Portland, uh, Oregon built. It's essentially a routing engine for different types of, um, of transport. And then he uses also like these, uh, this live feed of traffic, um, uh, like open traffic um, cameras to um, kind of share so you can plan your route before you head into town, uh, right into the traffic. Um, yeah, so about the routing as well, the Orzorim profile for cycling is actually, it's all like open source, so um, if you want to contrib contribute, you can do that. Um, and one of the guys from the city of Copenhagen is, um, is um, uh, maintaining that uh, routing profile for Orzorim. Uh, uh, cycling um, and so yeah he's always very interested and he also gave me a lot of tips of what types of tags in OSM are interesting so I'm going to contribute um, this to to the to the um, map of them later um, yeah and now the last thing because I want to come back to the smart cities is that um, uh, uh, this is a project that um, the city of Melbourne recently launched uh, we're really proud of it but actually they did it all we have nothing to do with it it's a um, uh, it's a, like they use Mapbox, but uh, it's essentially like um, showing um, a, a 3D model of the city, how it is, um, how it is um, now, <laughs> and then what other types of buildings are, um, are planned over time. And they are planning on literally creating this like real-time 3D model of the city, um, also using um, uh, cycling uh, uh, or um, kind of real-time data. Um, and um, it's really fascinating to see like how, if you think. Like um, you can, you can probably look at that data on the open data portal as well. Looking at like you know planning reports and um, uh, building um, uh, uh, planning uh, uh, permission uh, uh, requests, but it's not as interesting and um, informative as if you actually look at it like a citizen would experience it. And so for us, um, from Map of Cities, for us it's very important to um, find a, a good way of um, bringing the data that is somewhere which is free making it available to the citizens of cities to really um, kind of impact how the, the real environment um, around them is actually um, uh, like um, changing over time, um, rather than having just telling them, yeah, there's a CSV file on the, on the, on the portal. So yeah, that's the last slide. Um, I just wanted to say, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's uh, very important for us to also um, help cities um, contribute and work more with uh, OSM, which is very, it's a really huge part of, of uh, our work. Um, and yeah, that's, um, it's obviously challenging. <laughs> so if you have any questions, I'll be here all day. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. all right. mm -hmm. and I'm not really into the digital digital thing, so I brought only paper, not a presentation. Yesterday it seemed like a good idea, but now I'm not really sure. <laughs> so uh, this told me five minutes ago it has, had to be in English, uh, so excuse me for my bad English. Uh, I'm not really used to uh, present uh, in English. But anyway, I will try to explain uh, my idea. I'm just uh, an ordinary citizen uh, living in Antwerp in the north uh, of the city. I brought a map of my uh, <laughs> place where I live. Uh, I don't know if somebody is uh, familiar with uh, Antwerp, but it's in the northern part. 
some people call it uh, deprived neighborhoods, but for me, it's, uh, that sounds too uh, depressing. I really, really like my uh, neighborhood. I'm quite active as a citizen in my neighborhood. Um, I'm also a cyclist. I uh, cycle all the time to my work. Uh, I do everything with my bike. I'm also a race uh, biker. Um, so I really believe uh, the bike is a, a, a very important mean of transportation in the city. And in Antwerp, our policy makers are not really convinced of uh, uh, the, the importance of uh, bikes uh, in the city. They really like cars, and the, the city has to be accessible with the car everywhere. So we have a little bit of a problem uh, there. So as an ordinary citizen, I was asking myself, how can I uh, make my city more bike friendly? Um, I don't have any money. I don't have any knowledge. I don't have any instruments. I'm not, I have a smartphone, but I'm not really into the mapping thing. I'm not very extremely digital minded. So uh, yeah, I, I just uh, was trying to find a way to make my uh, neighborhood more bike friendly. Um, and then I came up with not a very uh, big idea as I uh, meant, uh, um, uh, everybody here is talking about root, rooting and everything. So it's not a very big idea, but I was trying to make a root map for my neighborhood. Uh, I'm not really digital, so I'm just was trying to, to make a, a paper map. Uh, I think everybody of you know these kind of maps, of user maps. Uh, there's a store here at the gallery. Uh, and I really like those maps, and I, I'm still into paper. When I go to cities, I'm always using paper maps. So my idea was to make a paper map, not an, an, an application. Uh, sorry, maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was also thinking about if I could make a map, how should I convince uh, the other people in my neighborhood to to uh, cycle on that route? That we, is, is it possible to 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 make a bottom-up uh, route plan for my neighborhood? And is it possible to convince the other people in my neighborhood to to ride on those lanes? So it's a kind of an experiment, and the thing was. To make a map like this, not only with routes of routes, what is it in English? routes, uh, um, but also to map all the, the things that make cycling in in, our, in my neighborhood pleasantly, like bike shops or stores where you can buy stuff, or that are bike friendly, like coffee bars and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, so the first step, as a not very smart citizen, maybe, was to collect data, and um, I was yeah. Just Googling, uh, that's something I can do. Uh, so I was trying to, to find uh, data. Um, and I came uh, to the website of our city council. I found lots of data. That was quite interesting. Uh, there were a lot of different types of data. There were also a lot of policy plans that I found, like uh, yeah, in Dutch it's a weg circulatie plan. I don't know what's in English. Uh, good circulation plan. Yeah, no, it's not, was that it's a neighbor <laughs> yes, it was, I think it was meant for cars. Uh, when I'm reading this, it's a way to, to uh, lead cars into my uh, neighborhood. I think it's not made for uh, bikes, I think. And yeah, I found a lot, lots of plans. Um, and I also know some um, civil servants in our city. I hope somebody was here. Maybe somebody knows him. Jos Schoepen is also into mapping data and he's trying to convince me to to uh, get uh, an open street map account and to start <laughs> mapping but <laughs> i'm afraid it won't work and so i asked him to map i i, I brought him sounds like yours <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I, I i collected all the data and i made i think there were 75 different uh, uh collector collections of data or, or how you call it, uh, and I, I gave it to him and I asked him to, to map it on OpenStreetMaps, but I couldn't convince him uh, yet, so I hope to see him here, but no problem, I will uh, see him in Antwerp. Um, and the thing that was quite impressive for me was that there were a lot of data, but they were everywhere, and they were not some, some, somewhere collected uh, by anyone. Also, there, you have a bike uh, policy plan in Antwerp since two years, and I also downloaded the, the, the policy plan, 
but the data were not collected in the plan, so that was quite impressive for me. Uh, what was also missing in the data was uh, the routes that people are using uh, in my neighborhood. I couldn't find any data, so I had to collect my own data, and uh, yes, I made this uh, incredible map uh, of my uh, neighborhood, and I also made a list with questions uh, on paper. And now, at this moment, we're doing roots uh, parties in my neighborhood with the 10 people. They all get a list, they get the 10, and they have to ask the questions uh, that, yeah, that I need. I need the information, and they just mark the roots uh, on the paper. And then yeah, we have to collect all the data and try to make a cycling method. It's not really professional, maybe, but. Uh, somebody can help me with uh, an application or something, please do that. Uh, so um, in September we will make a map just on paper. We won't make an application, but maybe, yeah, I think there are applications available. So I'm searching for applications today. So if you can help me, please join me. Um, and then the next step is to make a campaign in the neighborhood of convincing people to use those maps that we <coughs> pointed out. And yeah, I'm not really sure how we're going to convince people, but one of the ways that we are investigating is to uh, make something like that, but we would like to mark lanes on the street. Um, it's very difficult to convince our city council, and we're thinking of doing it anyway. Um, maybe if we don't get uh, permission, we'll do it. Some yeah. uh, also people, uh, <laughs> people yeah. like to paint it themselves, and actually, I'm, I'm really thinking of doing it. Uh, but there's no policy <laughs> <laughs> Um And then, yeah, next, also, the campaign is also used to collect more feedback from people because there are a lot of issues uh, in our neighborhood. There are only more bike lanes uh, in our neighborhood. neighborhood. So, um, there are a lot of uh, missing links, there's a lot of troubles, a lot of cobblestones, uh, a lot of traps, so it's not really fun thing to do to cycle in our neighbor, but I also would like to collect more feedback and to collect more, maybe, dynamics also uh, within the policy makers that to convince them to invest in more bike-friendly uh, streets. And that's also the idea at the end of this project, we're also having contact with the policy makers of our city, and we'll try to, yeah, uh, give them an inventory of all the, the missing links, the problems of our neighborhood, but we also would like to make, or to propose some easy solutions. I think with, with some small investments, you can do a lot of uh, good things with a lot of impact uh, to improve uh, uh, the bike friendliness of our uh, neighborhoods. And we're also making a uh, kind of uh, vision uh, for a, a more bike friendly city. And we'll, we'll try to make it uh, with a lot of citizens. Also, the, the city has its own plan, but uh, we read it and yeah, we're not, we were not really convinced. So today I'm searching for apps. I'm not really digital, you are, so I'm sure you will you can help me, so take your love if you can. Just all, all kinds of uh, um, applications or ideas to help me. Uh, yeah, I think not everybody is into the digital thing. Uh, you also talk about it. It's also important yeah, to, to make an open platform for everybody, not only with uh, people with smartphones, uh, but yeah, everybody should uh, join. Uh, so thank you very much. Are you also going to be here this afternoon? Normally, yes. yes. Okay. And many people will be willing to help. And then the last presentation before the coffee break, uh, Matt Dokkubu. Yeah, there is uh, um, another very nice citizen-driven initiative. Do you have your own computer? Yes. And do you have HDMI?
cameras but in the meantime <laughs> the media and the sound is recording right now so I'm also the sound so this is live streaming conversation <laughs> Because you don't, uh, uh, if you don't know the city, uh, you don't know which is the best path to, uh, to take. Uh, sometimes you will try to take uh, the path with the cycle way, but uh, sometimes it's not the best, uh, uh, the best path because uh, maybe uh, there is a lot of uh, traffic uh, there and it's, it's not very secure or you have uh, a lot of uh, road on your right. And so you have to stop and uh, and so the, the idea is to uh, compute uh, the site la uh, cyclabilité we call it it's uh, the how friendly is it to cycle on the road and uh, so we create a tool which is um, the user can uh, click on the road and give uh, a mark a note and the and the on the road to say if it's uh, friendly or not to, to use uh, this, uh, this road. So uh, this project was done for, the, uh, uh, for a French uh, association, which is called LADAV, l'Association Droit au Vélo, and it's uh, done in uh, Lille, uh, in North, um, all the North Pas-de-Calais. Um, and so we, I'm sorry, I I don't. I have some uh, some stuff to show you, but it's not uh, on this computer. But so, how does it work? Um, you have to create an account, and then you can. Um, yes, you have. Uh, yes, when when you uh, zoom on the on the roads. Uh, Sometimes we don't take some roads that are private or uh, roads that uh, that are for the motorway. Um, then you can click on the on the roads and then you can vote. Um, we um, uh, we, we uh, when you vote, you can say if you go from A to B or to B from A. You, you can go. You can give a, a global note, or you can give a, a note with a direction. Um, 
also uh, yes but and also you can vote for the the intersection because uh, all these uh, <laughs> okay. uh, because after that, uh, we were thinking about yes, there is the intersection. So um, but you, yeah, we can vote, but there is uh, you see the the we give a number to which uh, pass a road. Uh, who goes to the maybe this part is very pleasant if you go by a bike and this one it's not very nice because the, there is a lot of uh, traffic and so we cut at each intersection to be uh, for the routing algorithm to uh, to be sure we try now to to use it in Louvain la uh, but uh, so we deploy it for uh, Louvain la but it's not for the moment used but it's uh, the GRAC, the local GRAC, uh, the association GRAC for Louvain and want to use it, and uh, uh, but we, we don't have feedback for the moment. So. Uh, yes, and uh, so if you want, you can try to. Sometimes it's very, uh, it's not very easy to install the, all the stuff because it's quite complex. But uh, yes, uh, we can. Uh, I can uh, explain uh, how it works, and uh, we we try to. Is to, to put uh, the thing more easiest, and so we use a Docker machine. Yeah. And uh, if you use to Docker, uh, uh, it's more easier. Yeah. Because the, the thing which is quite uh, complicated is to uh, take all the data from OpenStreetMap and then to uh, cut, uh, to compute the, the small part of uh, where the people can vote. <coughs> Uh, yeah. So, so if you want, the project is there. <coughs> and, uh, yes. I guess I can give a small presentation in this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your. So now we will have a ten-minute coffee break, and after that we'll have four more presentations. Dus uh, dank u VRT, ze horen ons ook nog altijd spreken. Mm -hmm. um, 
En uh, dus we hebben het programma gekregen. En dan de vier iPods, plus de statieven. En dus al die vier iPods zijn nu gelinkt met deze applicatie. En dus ik kan kiezen welk beeld dat ik selecteer. En deze staat nog niet live, deze is in preview. En dan kan ik het verschuiven naar daar. En dit is nu live op dit moment. Ja, dat is goed. Ja, ja. Ja, ja. Ja, ja. Ja, handig. Echt wel handig, ja, ja. Maar kunt er wel door kunnen doen? Ja, ik heb. Dus, dit is nu de derde stream. Dat hebben we ook gedaan. We hebben ook zo'n lunchtag. Zo. Dat is een of coach. Tijdens de lunch. Nee, nee. Dat is wel een leerkracht. Alles goed om mogelijk in. Het is toch het is professioneel. Ja, zeker. zeker. Ja, ja. 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 En ook de kwaliteit is redelijk. Ja, dat zijn, zijn iPods, hè. dus het is 720. Dus een HD streaming wel. Ja, ook fijn. Ja, sorry. En de audio, ja, dat is gewoon een hetzelfde iPod zelf. Ja, uh, maar ja, dat zou ik ook nog graag een microfoon en een koppel op nu. Dus dat, uh, op nu, als ik beweeg, dan beweeg ik de audio met een week. Ik zou graag willen dat de audio eigenlijk uh, vast laat hebben. Ja, dat is ook nog. Is het dus als afstuur van de smartphone? Ja, ja, maar liever een koppel. Ja, dat is Het kan, emergency. Je kunt er elke Mac die vraagt de lucht voor handen en je gaat die altijd met een iPhone mee. We weten dat die kwaliteit beter is, dus ik heb gewoon een iPhone. Ja, ik heb het zo. Ik heb het zo. Ik heb het zo. Ja, bestanden op zo'n eigen ja, opleiding. Ja, 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 Korte filmpjes om te maken. Ja, ja, ja. Dan maak ik het ook wel met applicatie. Dat is Dat is een Dan heb ik een voor de op de wereldkaart aan zijn voor je. Oké, goed. Dus iemand als in de vijfde zijn een smartphone dat aan het opnemen. Maybe we should put all the things Aan het streamen zijn dus al die rode. Die hebben de waiting right now. Uh, maybe waiting slides. Uh, yeah, which is showing on the live stream. This open by that maybe you can put it on the screen as well. That's smart. So, yeah, this is all the streams that we have in the world. Super, super interesting what you're going to talk about. Yeah, it's funny because it's completely other. Cycle hack. And it's the PowerPoint, the, the big one. Yeah, it's the best, I think. You have this thing to move it? Yeah. Do you want to click it? I think that's what I'll do. I don't have like you have a split view. Okay. Uh, you just move forward. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Het is wel oké, okay, maar de kwaliteit kan beter, het geluid kan beter, het kan ook zoveel rekening ook zo. Wat is dat? Maar het is ook voor dat het goed gebruikt. Ja, dat is het is wel zo Ja, inderdaad. Ik het een tof om te leren. Het is een vraag. Ik kan bijleren dat ik een beetje dat ik jou snel kennen. Ik heb een beetje dat ik jou snel kennen. Ik heb een beetje dat ik jou snel kennen. Ik heb een beetje dat ik jou snel kennen. Ik heb een ja, ja, Garvin voor Big C. Ja, ja, ja. uh, nee. Ja, er bestond nog geen goede voor in tijd te, uh, te mappen. Uh, we hebben de graag aan het licht, het licht Als je er een bos rijdt, tegen dat het een beetje normaal is. Schaduwen kan je allemaal niet tegen. Maar dat zal ook wel evolueren waarschijnlijk. Heel, heel traag, traag, heel traag. Als uh, de economie dan waarschijnlijk speelt, dus hoe meer dat er verkoopt voor Ja, maar voor onze, toep onze, voor onze toepassing van Mapudari, voor uh, st street school. Wat is dat? Hoe is dat gebeurd? Ja, dus... Uh, dat is ja, dus wel, uh, we zijn op de markt dat er niemand iets speciaals voor ontwikkelt. Nee. Ja, ik ga u nog wel zien, zeker. Ja, ik heb het hier verteld. Ja, ik had moeten presentatie geven, want ik dacht dat iedereen dat al kende, dat die mij nodig was. Nee, maar zegt hij mij dat het al als mij heeft genoeg verbast. Ja, Okay, hello. I'm gonna start. My name is Manuel. Um, I'm originally from Hamburg in Germany, but since 13 years, more or less, I live in Brussels. I work here and I cycle. And as a cycling citizen, I joined two years ago the Cycle Hack uh, Weekend. I will explain a bit more what that is, and I'm gonna talk about uh, the network, the regional cycle network in Brussels. Uh, a bit like Kuhn uh, earlier, from a more analog point of view, but I think there's interesting uh, touch points with all the digital. <coughs> so for those who don't know, quickly, CycleHack is a, is a global movement. It's quite new, and more and more cities have CycleHack weekends. Um, I'm sure there is one this year, I, I think in September. September. You know, yes, September, there's another one. I personally joined in 2015, and the CycleHack weekends spontaneously find questions to, to work on about uh, cycling. Um, hack means uh, you want to maybe find a quick solution or start with a sketch of a solution. It's very quick, uh, fast pace. You, you find a, a group spontaneously on the first evening and then you have two days to work, to think, to uh, make a group work with a, with a result that is presented in the end. So um, our group worked on improvements for the existing regional cycle network and uh, the result was that we came up with some prototypes um, there were prizes to win and we also won a prize because uh, people thought that our project was very realistic um, another consequence was that we were actually invited by the city of Brussels not the city the region we talked uh, to the um, responsible cabinet for for mobility which is uh, the cabinet of Pascal Smet and they also invited us to join some meetings with the administration, which is Brussels Mobility, who actually do this network. So, um, we were basically a room full of cyclists, and one of the guys came up with, uh, have you ever seen this thing here? And it was very funny that uh, the big majority of people in the room who are all cyclists in Brussels have never seen these things. And there's hundreds of them in Brussels, hundreds. Every corner has this sign, and nobody knew what it was good for. So we had a project. It was very easy. Uh, uh, everybody agreed. We're cyclists. There, is a, there seems to be a network, um, but we don't know anything about it. So 
we, we had the project, let's, let's find out what we can improve, because if we don't know this network and we don't use it, who else would ever use it? Um, so what we did is uh, do some field work, and you see, of course, what we found out is that there is a map, but it's a PDF. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not completely on the screen here, I think. Yeah, there you have it. Just for fun, we printed out the PDF and thought, is that navigation on the network? Of course, it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> And yeah, so the, the problem was map immediately in our heads. But not only, because I'm talking about the physical world here, because this guy here helps me to explain there is something in the physical world that is maybe the first step. So, of course, immediately thinking about maps, we thought about we are digital people, our phones and, and apps and so on. But we went a step back, because we thought, if you see these signs, you should be able to use them. And if this PDF is the only navigational aid that there is, then you are pretty stuck. Because nobody will go and download a PDF to plan uh, how it goes from A to B, uh, or even spontaneously use this. So what we came up, we heard it earlier today already, is that we thought there's many, many years of experience with uh, public transport and networks. Just look at the metro, and there you go. Everybody can use a metro even if you arrive in a city on the first day. You will understand how that works. We looked at what it is actually that makes a metro easy to use. And we imagined what a metro would be without it. So just quickly, it's clear you have, you have line maps, you have stations, you have uh, a clear in indications where you are. Um, we even thought about the driver. You sit in the metro and you can read a book. You just have to know where, you, where to get off. You don't have to permanently watch that the metro is going in the, in the right way. So there, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's a number of things that make it very easy to plan a trip from A to B and to then re really do it and not having to navigate yourself through it all the time. If it was without, then it would obviously be difficult. So we had a few sub-projects then for the weekend. We divided in groups, and one of the groups thought about a more simple map, a map like a metro map. We looked at the existing network, and we imagined there could be stations in between points. And because we saw that some modern metro maps uh, use a circular way, and because the network in Brussels also has circle lines, we came up with this. But it's really a prototype. This is not totally correct. We did it in a few hours, and so um, it was just a, a first go on it. And then we imagined um, that this map should be everywhere because it's no, uh, at the moment you don't have it in the physical world that you see the network actually on a map. We put Photoshop there because we were um, afraid like we would be accused of vandalism. Uh, we did this in Photoshop. Other things we did in real because it's a cycle hack, so you do some hacks. But um, this is real. So we imagined that if you have a line like a cycle route 2 or 2A, if you would come up with stations, station names somehow. Maybe not all, because of these you have a lot. That would be too much that each one of these has a station name. But if, if every fifth or so would be a, a landmark, we thought you could actually put on this post here a map line to, to ensure people who are driving through the city where they are and where they're going. The simple problem of this thing is you don't know where you are and you don't know where you're going. And that was our main take on improving in the physical world uh, your navigation. And then, yeah, app, we thought, okay, you have to be able to access something that gives you more information. We didn't have any time on the weekend, so we just put a blog up which said what is the route, where it's going, and some pictures of it. But of course, this can be linking to much more advanced stuff. And Kuhn also talked about this, um, and we didn't paint the street, we photoshopped it, but we had the same idea. If you're on the orange line, why not make things that exist in the color of your uh, route? We talked about this in the administration. Of course, they know it's difficult. There's laws, and you cannot use these colors or that. And, but we were free of that, so we were just uh, freely uh, inventing ideas. Now well, again, so this is just a summary. You have stations. You know where you are when you get on a, a line in the metro. Uh, you have a simple map that is not like with all the geographical detail, but just telling you from A to B where you have to go or take another line. Um, there's a line map within the line that is reduced to where you are on and where you're going. 
And the driver not getting lost for us is the colors on the street. If you can follow a, a color marking all the time, you know you're on the right track. And yeah, uh, you have online support. And I think there's, this is actually where these two worlds meet. The metro network with all this physical help, which everybody understands, can of course be improved digitally because you can have real-time information. There's a lot of things. I use a lot of uh, public transport apps all the time. Um, but addition, the basics have to be there first. I, if, if, I, if I know when my metro comes, this is great as a digital help. But then in the metro, I really rely on the simple things, like on, on the map, on the thing on the wall, to know to just when the metro comes into the station, to know, oh, this is uh, Arloa, I, I have to step off or, or change metro. So I think for us, we didn't explore uh, the digital detail of it. Uh, we just thought there has to be the basics done first, because if you have so many sites built, it must have cost a lot of money to put hundreds of these in the city. 3,500. 3,500. OK. <laughs> 3,500 of these guys, and many cyclists have never spotted one. It's in, it's in front of your eyes, but you don't see it. So if this is there, then we thought you, sh you should put other physical help in place to make this <coughs> And so we said, okay, you can translate all the metro uh, language to, to the cycle world in a way that you put also stations with names, with map, you have a line map, um, you cannot get lost if you're guided better, and of course, any type of online support would help. Yeah, and uh, <coughs> that's what we did in the weekend. Um, we presented exactly the same thing to, to, to the government um, uh, cabinet and, and in an in a administration meeting. And we, we found that, of course, we didn't uh, reinvent the wheel. They had, they had thoughts of that as well. But uh, they were not very advanced. And um, I'm very happy to see that this conversation has continued and has added <coughs> other things, like, for example, the open street maps coming in here, which I think is absolutely helpful. Um, our group doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> now then there was a new cycle hack and this year again um, but I think it's good because the ideas keep keep going and I'm happy that I, I could uh, show this again here two years after and see that really things happen um, we think that the digital support of it as I said is very important there's other things we saw as a future development um, and I think it will, it will happen uh, it was clear maybe as a feedback from our meetings with all the involved people that there is a they are constant that this is not known enough, and this is not usable enough. And I think uh, steps are being taken to make it more, more usable. And that's it. According to the schedule, uh, Outside of Brussels, from outside of Belgium. Yeah, one or two. So most of you are guys are from here. Okay. Um, because I'm starting off not with a solution, but with a few questions that are really specific for Hamburg about bike usage in Hamburg. But maybe you can try to get the principles and I don't know think about your city, how the actually the current status in your city. So yeah, it's about analyzing and visualizing bike. Uh, bike usage data in Hamburg and specifically for bike sharing. We've got a bike sharing system called Stadtrat. It's more or less the same thing as you got. They call it called Velo or something. Yeah, so it's the same thing. Um, yeah, I want to start off with the question, how does Hamburg measure bike usage? Um, I started off just actually two weeks ago to trying to find out how Hamburg is planning all this bike infrastructure and a little, little bit of research and I came up with 
a uh, few things. First thing is like household surveys. I mean, pretty much every European city got this classic ho household surveys. They get people called, they get uh, step up to their door, ask them whether they use the car to get from A to B, they use bike or they walk. But you see like the last ones were in 2002 and 2008. So yeah, for data driven people, it's not really, um, I mean, not really current data, not a lot of data to play with. So not really interesting for us right now. The second thing is automatic counting stations. I have no idea if there's something like this in Brussels. Uh, you can imagine this, there's like a, like, a, like a machine next to a bike path and it just counts uh, literally how many people passing by. Um, this is pretty expensive. You, I don't know how much is this. So like a couple of thousand euros. And one of these machines is like 30,000 euros. So it's super expensive to get just data for one point. And you know, so if you want to make up like a few stations, it's going to be super expensive. Um, and there's only one in operation. So from a data perspective, not really a lot of data here as well. Um, third thing is a little bit more interesting. There are manual counting once per year at 38 different locations in Hamlet, which means people, actually people are going out every year um, at 38 different locations in Hamlet and just measure how many people, uh, how many bikes are passing by. Um, so this is like really the only data we got. This is the data used to plan all the infrastructure about um, bike usage in Hamburg. Um, so I, I don't know, the first two are not really interesting from the data perspective I said, uh, but I think the last one, um, I thought, okay, just I want to have a look into this data. What is this data about? Is this data really good? Uh, because it's really the only data they use to plan infrastructure in Hamburg. Um, and to put it up a little map to show you where are the different um, different locations where they count manually each year. So you can like see these red dots. Um, yeah, they are, I mean, there are 30, 38 of them, but as you can see, I mean, there's not a lot of measuring, right? There's not measuring here, there's not no measuring here, there's no measuring here, and it's just really points in the city, it's not streets, you know, you know, have no idea between A and B, between two stations, or between two manual counting points, how many people have them, so it's just, I don't know, pretty random from my point of view. Um, so I had a look at the data from these 38 different uh, manual counting locations in the city, and which is gave me quite interesting result because everybody in Hamburg, uh, maybe you know, is talking about that bike bike usage is getting more and more. Everybody using a bike. They need to plan more infrastructure. They need to plan more bike paths, I mean, which is really great, and I think this is really true. But if you look at the official data, this is actually surprising because. I mean, it's going up, it's going up, it's going up. But until the last two years, actually, it's a little bit stagnating. So that was really, really surprising because then I um, had a look what are the last official graph they put out from, from the government. And it was actually here, the last one they put out here. So I don't know, for the last three or two and a half years, they didn't put any data out. So still everybody's saying, yeah, bike usage is just going up, it's going up, it's going up. But if you look at the official data, it's not really representative. I mean, I'm taking a bike every day in Hamburg, and I'm for sure that there's more bikes over the years, but if you look at the official data, it's really interesting that it's not true to the official data. So um, I just had a quick look into the, all these different 38 locations where they measure uh, how many people passing by. So we got the different years here, um, and you see how many people got counted on a bike. And what you see really uh, at these 38 different measuring locations is complete randomness. <laughs> because, I don't know, I can just um, just have a look at it and I'm going to go through them because uh, there are 38 of them. You see all kinds of, of patterns there. You see some patterns going up from about from yeah, 50 to 70 percent. Some are going down, some are going up and down. And what they're publishing here is really is this graph. <laughs> and if you're a little bit into data and data science, you know this. I don't know, this is not a great graph to come up with, but the <laughs> underlying data is super random. So, yeah, interesting. So this is really the only official data source right now in Hamburg, which is used to plan infrastructure. So I thought about, why not use open data to measure bike usage? Um, just last week, um, I was contacting the official political <coughs> person who is in charge of all this um, bike infrastructure planning. 
and then ask them if they're using something else than just these 38 manual um, counting, um, counting locations. And they do not, um, and as she said, there are some plans with partnerships with universities to use this open data, but there's not really something happening. And I also sent her my stuff, but she didn't seem to be so interested in that. Um, <laughs> So yeah, but still the question, why not use open data? I mean, we have seen so many great things already in this presentation, so many great data sources that maybe can be used, and they're gonna be better than just these 38 stations. So um, I made a map, it's like an interactive map um, of the bike sharing usage in Hamburg. Um, it's really great because the they got all the booking data pretty freely available on an open data platform. And I came up with a um, yeah with an interactive map like this. I can just show it real quick. Um, it's gonna be this one here. Um, so yeah, what you basically see this is one month of data from June last year. Um, and yeah, you just can. I mean, if you compare, if you remember the the picture, of what I um, what I um, what I showed you with the thirty eight uh, measuring stations. And if you compare to this kind of data set, there's really different. And I mean, there's, you can see really um, which streets are go, go, um, which streets have been used. What is the frequency in each of these streets? And um, you can see all the, these red dots are the are the um, stations where you can rent a bike. So you can really see some spots. I mean, this is like um, a lake in, in, in Hamburg in the city center. It's called Alster, and it's like one of the most for me and for a lot of other people, bikers are like really pro problematic spots because there are just too many people, too many bikers, too many tourists walking around the lake, too many people just coming together. And this is actually the spot where they built this one little um, automatic counting station. So I don't know, that was 30,000 users and you just can take this data and see um, there are actually really a lot of people going there. So they need to build like expensive machines to, to count that. It's obvious if you just look at the bike sharing later. Um, yeah, there's going to be a workshop this afternoon um, on how to build this map. This map is built with uh, the R program language. I don't know if there's any people in here using R. Not so many. <laughs> <laughs> See, like, you had. Okay, but um, yeah, it's actually it's just around 70 lines of code. Um, and I made a pretty, um, uh, pretty short example of the Belgian bike sharing system for this afternoon. So it's going to be exactly the same looking map, ju uh, map just with the date of Belgium. So I'm going to show you how to, you can build this like in 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes for your own city. Um, and it's open source on my GitHub, so you can just, if you into R, you can use this code um, to build your own map. Um, yeah, just a little trick, um, get back to the presentation. Um, but yeah, this is not. All right. Um, yeah, bike sharing is not the only um, open data source, I guess, because this is a really good data source. But there, we heard, uh, we already heard. I think it was your talk about Java Metro. There's like a huge data source as well, which is, I think it's, there is an API which is freely available, but it's really restricted. Yeah, exactly. I think you get um, for free. You you get, yeah, it's, it's, it's an amount of uh, yeah. minutes or, or, or kilometers or something yeah. like that, yeah. So, but I don't know, I've heard like 30, I don't know what it is, like 80 cities already having like in contract with Server Metro, paying them to get the data, and I think it's not really expensive compared it is, to... It's quite expensive, yeah. but it's not, uh, yeah. Well compared it's, it to is like building stations and stuff. Yeah, no, no, it's not comparable, yeah. but um, the problem is with Strava Metro is that it's not only, it's not, it's, it's not clear if it's all types of cyclists or if it's just cyclists on their race bikes trying to yep. get out of the city. Um, and it depends on the city, of course, but um, you, as I said as well, you need to com combine um, different data sources. Yeah. yeah, that's what I wanted to say, like exactly. I think you cannot find any data source which really is representative for the whole city, yeah. but it's, I think these two things, like the bike sharing data and the Strava Metro data is like, huge step from just this manual counting station every year. Because you just need to think about counting bikes once a year. Um, I mean, what happened if there's like a construction taking place in the street? What happened if it rains that day? 
no one is going by bike, so that's why this is complete randomness with the 38 stations they got. Mm -hmm. So I think this could be like a huge step forward to, I mean, this is open data, this is available. The governments want to do a lot with open data, so he, it's the right source to use, I guess. Um, so that's it. There's going to be a workshop this afternoon. Um, if you want to find out how to build these maps, I built a little thing for Brussels, so you can check this out. I was still uh, working on the presentation, so I need to go <laughs> to the beginning of the presentation. I'm sorry. Um, my name is Wies. I work for uh, the Fietsestroms. That's uh, this uh, cycling uh, organization <laughs> here in uh, Brussels and uh, Flanders. Um, some uh, one mentioned GRAC, uh, that is the or partner organization in French talking partner. Um, just a quick uh, introduction about what's the Fietsenbond, who is the Fietsenbond. We are an independent non-profit organization and we are uh, working on lobbying for all cyclists, um, functional cyclists, uh, but also re recreative cyclists. Um, we have some uh, services that we uh, offer to uh, policy makers. For example, we have our measuring bike, um, which measures the uh, cycling infrastructure uh, in Flanders and in Brussels also. Uh, we have a lot of members and our members are uh, very important for us because uh, not only they uh, pay their yearly contribution, um, <laughs> which gives us funding, um, but they are also uh, the uh, really experienced cyclists. I mean, everyone who takes the bike from home to school, from home to work, uh, is a really experienced cyclist and those like, experience we need to uh, do our lobby working. Uh, we have also a bike to work program um, in which we uh, try to um, promote the bicycle to go from home to work <coughs> and to commute uh, by bike. And uh, we work a lot of about communication from of what we are doing behind the screens in our lobby working and that kind of things. Um, we have 11 uh, paid staff members in Brussels, but we have uh, more than 500 uh, local volunteers who are very active in local groups, and we have about 80 local groups. You see on the map, the green spots are uh, cities uh, where we have an, uh, an active local group of pizza spots. Uh, the uh, light green spots are uh, cit cities where we have uh, at least one person who is uh, a contact person and can help us. Why are those local groups very important? Um, even if we have 11 paid staff members here at the office in Brussels, if uh, the uh, local city, for example, Ypres, uh, which is over here, 
if they are asking us, uh, well, we would like to improve our infrastructure, we don't know how the infrastructure is in Ipa. So we need the input from our local groups and we uh, work together with the local groups so that they can uh, uh, do proposals to improve the cycling network. A quite short evolution, uh, Fietsesbond starts uh, in uh, the 90s, um, basically asking for cycling lanes in the city. That was a very important need. We need more cycling lanes. Uh, lanes. Uh, Kuhn was telling only five uh, or four cycling lanes in the north of Antwerp. So in a lot of cities, there's, this still is a problem. But from cycling lanes, we want to cycling infrastructure, which is much more than only uh, making a cycling path, but also uh, uh, giving the opportunity to um, stall the, the bike safely, the, to have uh, other kinds of infrastructure. We are moving to a cycling policy, and we now want to go to an integrated cycling policy in which the bicycle is uh, the key uh, thing when you do urban planning, when you do uh, city planning, when you work around mobility. Um, what about our data? Well, um, we have, as I said, 80 local groups. We have 500 active volunteers, which means that we have more than hundred ways of collecting data and um, uh, using that data. Um, to be honest, or uh, the most, uh, uh, the average uh, age of our uh, volunteering group is about 55, 60 years old. Um, so as Kuhn, really not into the digital world at this moment. Um, so <laughs> most of the data collection is in a way like this, uh, a little stand on a, a local gradually uh, info market where uh, people uh, can put on uh, a photo and telling, well, I like to bike there or no, I don't like to bike there because of that. Some of our local groups then make uh, a nice viewing cahier uh, uh, or a brochure. Uh, with some IDs that they hand over to the uh, local government and where the local government can work on and uh, try to see if there are quick wins that they really can improve without a lot of in investing. Um, but we have also digital data. Maybe you know this project is called the Fietstelweg. It was the second time uh, last year they, uh, that we organized this together with the uh, Fietspedat, another partner in cycling in Flanders. Um, actually, um, we asked people to download an app from the Fietstyle Week and uh, to start uh, the app when you uh, start cycling. And the app was collecting all the cycling uh, um, routes you did. This gave a lot of information about where uh, cycling is in, uh, where the cyclists are cycling in Flanders, uh, how long they are cycling, um, and uh, these data. Uh, are used um, in a Dutch um, project uh, called Bike Print. Um, but you see that they only use uh, a data set from 2006, and that's another problem. Uh, 2014, sorry. Uh, and that's another problem that we have a lot of data, but how to use it and how to um, work with it is, is at, at this moment really the problem. Um, because there are a lot of tools that are really interesting. I just uh, show you this one. Here you can <coughs> see that you can uh, uh, you can look at the cycling routes or that are used, and you can even look uh, are people um, making a detour because of better infrastructure, uh, the cycling highways like they call them in Belgium. Um, you can do that, but if you don't get the data, the, the real life data, uh, it's not really in tool that is used in uh, cycling planning at this moment. Um, this is a bit better. It's uh, a uh, heat map from an actual project that is running here in Brussels. It's called Ping If You Care. It's a project that is collaborating with uh, the Bike Citizens app, you probably who maybe know. Uh, what it's doing is that you have a little pinger, uh, like the bicycle bell, uh, on your uh, steering wheel. And every time you uh, feel unsafe, you give a ping. Uh, which means that this is uh, um, a subjective way to see how is the infrastructure in Brussels. You see that a lot of pings are 
going on in the big uh, uh, um, car lanes in Brussels. Um, very interesting um, initiative because it's uh, uh, citizens orient orientated, uh, citizens orientated. Um, but as an advocacy uh, organization, for us, point is what will the government doing? Will what will they do with this kind of data? Because actually now they are collecting data from about 1,000 users of the pin. Um, actually, we provided, we can provide that kind of data since 10 years, uh, just by our members who are doing cycling it all day. But in projects like Smart Citizens, it's very fancy to uh, put a lot of money in that kind of project. What we don't know is what will happen and will this project have an effect on how uh, cycling in Brussels can improve. Another data set we have is uh, our Bike to Work program. It's really simple, it's a screenshot of the website. What it's doing is uh, you just put on, uh, yeah, I have to do it for uh, <laughs> the month of July, you just put on if you're going with your bike uh, to your work or if you're uh, not biking uh, that day. Uh, and then it's, uh, you set, it, you, uh, when you um, register, you give in your uh, starting point and your ending point uh, using Google Maps. Um, and so what is, in, what is interesting here is that um, a company collects the data to get uh, a subvention for your commuting uh, traffic tra tra in Belgium. It's possible to have a Fietsvergoeding, as they say, uh, and this collects the data from all uh, employees and send it, uh, makes it easier to uh, pay uh, with your end of the month. Another data set is this bicycle. It's the measuring bike. Very quick. Um, it's a bike uh, that we are using uh, mainly in the province of Antwerp, uh, where we are really uh, measuring all cycling infrastructure uh, from A to B in the province, all the big uh, cycling uh, ways. Um, it, for example, what the, um, it, it gives uh, a better view on the uh, comfort of the cycling paths. Um, and what we used it for is that we now convinced the government of uh, the Flemish government uh, if they invest in new cycling infrastructure that it should be asphalt uh, as this. This uh, shows us that that is the best uh, structure for uh, making uh, a cycling infrastructure. Um, another project uh, is uh, called My Bike World. Um, it's all about an ID, an online, an online platform for innovative uh, cycling ideas. Uh, keywords are positive, bicyclists, sports cyclists, solution oriented and community based. It's not about complaining, it's not for passion politics. It's really important. Why? Because also we gave the opportunity, um, it's a project that uh, uh, took place uh, in the last two months. And we gave the opportunity to cities and to uh, local governments uh, to add and comment on what uh, people were uh, suggesting. Um, here you see it's a map using OpenStreetMap uh, uh, data where you just um, put on a point and say, well, I, will, I would like to improve uh, this path in that way. And the city could give feedback on the cyclist project and work with it further on. Here you see uh, the north of Antwerp, uh, where there were a lot of a lot of uh, IDs put on the the map. Um, and then you, uh, in the last phase of the project, uh, we asked people to vote for the project. Um, for example, here in Antwerp, I don't know if people know, the, the, but here you have um, uh, the Schelde, which uh, cross the which divides the city a, a bit. Uh, but it's very difficult for uh, a cyclist to get from <coughs> the uh, left side to the right side of the city, uh, especially if they use the uh, the tunnel, a tunnel uh, where the lifts are broken more than they are working. Um, so a lot of projects and a lot of votes were here to make a bridge over the scale for a bicycle bridge or a uh, that kind of things that would improve uh, to go from one point to the uh, from, from one side to the other side. Um, we had a professional professional jury who voted, uh, who 
we uh, looked at all the proposals and we choose one pro project per region because we also did it in Brussels and in French uh, part of Wallonia um, and one project per cycling city. What will we do with these results? Well, we know with this project what the ideas of and the needs of people are and we keep with our 80 local groups those suggestions on top of mind and use it in our advocacy work to uh, have more uh, good infrastructure. Um, what's next? Well, uh, just city planning. Um, this is how it is uh, uh, nowadays. It used to be a horse and uh, just uh, walking. Uh, since the 20s, the car came and then it usually it's completely changed and all cities, mobility in all cities is really uh, car oriented and not uh, cycling or uh, pedestrian oriented. Um, this is how we want that it will be in the future. And um, why do I show this? Because using data, open data uh, from cyclists is for us a tool to give IDs to our local groups and uh, to keep their lists that they already have to keep them updated and to give to go in interaction with local authorities. We believe this is the new way of advocacy work that we have to do. Uh, nevertheless, classical advocacy remains needed, but services, service, opinions, and projects strengthen our opinion and our insight and visibility. Um, so that's about the piece of and data to uh, um, just to end, we are looking and eager to collaborate uh, and to see what we can do with our data and what you can do with our data and how we can make matches in the future. Thank you. Okay, now we have one last speaker which has not been announced but which is too good to, yeah. Keep <laughs> uh, aside. Um, it's Gaetan, and he's from Innovis, and yeah. uh, they have now a very big call uh -huh. regarding mobility coming yeah. up. Uh, so um, say a few words about it. Yeah, sure. Okay, so my excuse is it's kind of improvised, uh, <laughs> so I didn't really know what to. Uh, we met during coffee break. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> perfect. Okay, uh, so uh, as we said, I'm from Innovis. Innovis is the uh, Brussels regional administration that supports innovation and research. Um, and we are working together with other administrations, Brussel um, Mobile, Brussel Mobilité, uh, MUVB STIP, uh, CIBG, CRIB, uh, and uh, Parking Brussels. We're working together since uh, a few years now in the Smart Mobility Committee. And the idea is actually to, um, well, uh, to work for a better mobility in Brussels. That's the idea behind this. Now, we are launching a smart mobility challenge in September. So on the 26th of September, there is a brokerage event. Uh, and what is this brokerage event for? It's for a call, as Dries said. It's a call where we are actually putting 4 million euros on the table um, for smart mobility. The idea is actually to bring together different stakeholders from our society. So I don't know if you're, uh, uh, if you know what living labs are, uh, the quadruple helix idea behind it. So the idea is to actually bring together citizens, organizations, non-profits, uh, what else, uh, companies and government organizations actually. Politicians. Politicians, if they want to join, definitely, definitely. Uh, so what we are aiming for are actually um, propositions that will actually uh, enhances the, the mobility situation in Brussels, and especially based on, on data, obviously. Um, so what we are doing is actually, so on the 26th, well, we, I, I will give the, the information uh, to Dries, but the, the idea is that people can come and actually have a pitch about their, their solution or about a challenge they, they have here in Brussels about mobility, and uh, afterwards we will work uh, in, in the form of, uh, of uh, an, an, well workshops where people actually can can defend the, their ideas and actually discuss about it and the the whole thing the, is that at the end of the brokerage event we will have actually um, 
uh, consortia that will have formed and people can work together and, and actually hand in uh, a proposal. So that's it actually. So 26th of September, I will diffuse the information through you and uh, I hope I can see a lot of you on that day. Thank you. Uh, so these were the presentations so far. We will uh, share all slides after the event. Um, and before we'll start with the workshops, we'll have lunch now. The lunch already arrived. Sandwiches are in the cafeteria with a nice view on uh, Brussels Central Station. So let's all move to the cafeteria. And then at what was it? Uh, 1.30 starts the second part, which are the workshops. Thank you.